Okay, today I'm talking again to Professor Lauren Steimer, who we talked to in the summer about um, stunt workers and action films, and we promised that we would we would talk again. So, Lauren, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm okay. Um, it's very turning in. It's turning into winter uh, in Britain now, and it's like I'm starting to feel like I need to hibernate. But I see you've got a fan going behind you, so like, yeah, yeah, South Carolina is always always warm. We do have winter. Um, but it's nothing like your winter. I'm, from my experience of being in the UK, there's a kind of cold there, even in the like spring and uh, autumn months, that just kind of gets right through you. It's like no other cold I've experienced <laughs> in the world. And it really made me understand, other than colonialism, why so much tea drinking happens, because <laughs> whew, it just goes right to your bones. Yeah. I have a, a colleague who's from Canada and she says that, you know, Canada gets damn cold, but she said she's known nothing like the the strange, unique, eccentric coldness of Britain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's so let's talk about um, about martial arts and uh, stunt workers and choreography and films, because last time we talked was in kind of late spring and now it's it's autumn winter. And we promised that we would go, go back to some specific films that you think are really important films to, to think about. And since that time, you have you have um, composed and recorded like the ultimate one stop shop lecture on stunt workers and action choreography and so on, haven't you? And you've, you've made that available to people, but you're not making it publicly available, right? No, I can't make it publicly available. Um, well, I probably legally can. I just don't want to fight any legal battles with the studios. Uh, I'm sure everyone who works on media knows that when we talk about individual clips from films or TV shows that we have the right to do so in an educational setting or for educational value. And that's fabulous. But sometimes the studios will give you a little pushback on that. Um, and I want to make it available to everyone, uh, but I have to make sure that people are using it for educational value. So if there's anyone who's listening to this podcast who wants to learn more uh, about stunt work, how to study stunt work, how to speak about stunts and fights more specifically, uh, and talk about cinematography and editing and the like, uh, please contact me. Uh, my email address, I think you could include it uh, under the YouTube video, and then Good, people yeah. are welcome I will. to contact I will. Mental note, I will. <laughs> so, you, but your email address, so it's, it's Lawrence Steimer at University of um, South Carolina and, or Southern Carolina, and um, it's just available online. It's easy to find you online, it right? It is easy to find me and I will provi provide any of you, anyone who's interested with the link to the entire lecture, which comes in three parts. So you can learn how to study stunt work and why we should be looking at stars less than we do. Uh, you can learn what the some of the key terms are that stunt people might use and how to identify them. And then you can look at some specific scenes and see how to uh, examine them in more detail. Yeah, it's really, it's, I, you sent it to me, well, you, I got the links yesterday and I've spent uh, the morning, which uh, it was a Monday morning for whenever this is broadcast, watching the, um, watching the, it's great. It was, it's, in total, I watched about two and a half hours and the first, the first section is all about the academic study of films and action films. And it's really fascinating for anyone who has an interest in the way that action films have been studied by scholars in film, media, cultural studies, and what they've missed so much, which is the below the line, the, the, the people that you, you talk about, the people you don't, the, who aren't, they might be acknowledged in the credits, like, mm -hmm. but but their work is the, the, so fundamental, the technological skill set and apparatus and, and everything that you don't think about if you're just thinking about camera angles and, and stars. And then the second is it's deeper into the the different kind of technical terms that we might use and a deeper analysis of them. And then the third section, which is really short and really punchy appropriately enough, just kind of blasts through, like, this is how you can see what's happening, see where the stunt work is happening, and, 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 and these are the terms and concepts that are used. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, I wanted to make something that people might find useful. I, I also think that, you know, we, we've done, the field, many people in different fields have done great work on action, well, I'd say action film and TV, but mostly just action film, though we should look at TV in so much more detail. Um, but so few people are doing this kind of work. And I just, um, 
I'm not territorial. I don't want to be the only person doing this kind of work. I think we should all see the kind of labor that happens behind the scenes and start recognizing it more. Because we've talked about the body of the action performer as spectral. It's not that we should stop talking about that in relation to starts. I'm not asking anyone to stop talking about that. Uh, I'm just suggesting that we could pay a little bit more further attention to the people who really deliver um, the part of the action spectacle that most of us get so excited about. Mm. Because it is exciting to see, um, I'm, I'm really going old timey here for a, a lot of the younger students who might be watching, but Arnold flexes muscles or Sylvester Stallone flexes muscles or seeing uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme do a split. These are exciting things, but all of those people have, have stunt performers, stunt doubles who are working for them as well. And they do some really dynamic things on screen. Which actually, that's a. I was watching through. So you teach people. You're teaching us how to count the fight beats. So the basic unit of a fight would be pow, pow, whoop. That would be three beats. And then if there's a cut, if there's a cut, then you go back to one again. And you go, well, let's just see how many beats there are per um, sequence before they cut. And some films, you talk about how they really like the short editing. So like, if you like the the fights choreography in the Born Identity films. It's like, it's probably less than one beat per cut sometimes because it's so, it's cut so fast. But what was really controversial in that was you say, you say, so this, so, so we got Stallone, we got Van Damme and you're going, that's Stallone against, against a stunt worker and that's, and, and so on and so on. And then when Van Damme delivers his characteristic uh, jumping, spinning back kick, is jump and spinning hoop kick, you you actually say, I think that's uh, the stuntman against stuntman. Yeah. And, and so you're saying not only do these people not do their stunts, even if they say they do their stunts, uh -huh. but Van Damme's signature spinning jumping kick, you're saying stunt worker. Uh, in that instance, in that one instance that we're watching, yes. Uh, of course, sometimes he, he is doing that, especially when you look at the older films. Yeah. Uh, the older films, they're not doing performance capture of the actor's face and putting it on there. And certainly, I'm not saying Van Damme can't do these things. Yeah. Uh, he, he has the skill set, but they're not going to endanger him. And really, often what happens for a lot of stars, and even people like Van Damme who can do more, is that they, they get up there and they do some moves, and then they'll shoot it with a stuntman without that actor and the stunt person will deliver a, a kind of more fluid performance than the actor. Maybe the actor, it, I'm gonna give them benefit of the doubt, is tired, is older, is arthritic, you know, what, what whatever. But um, yeah, it's, it's better, especially for the quick cuts, if you're gonna get stunt man or stunt woman against, against another stunt person, because then nobody's gonna get hurt and you're gonna get it more quickly. Mm. And you also, um, there's an interesting point where you you line up some photographs of the star, the actor, and their stunt double. And you say, look at the posture. You like, you kind of, I think it's actually more subtle than, I think you're so used to seeing it. Yeah, I know. Look, I felt so bad you, about you say, that. You see, in these photographs, you can see that the stunt worker is much more upright and their, that their heads are, are much more uh, vertical. Yes. Um, which is which is true, but but it and then you're saying the the actors tend to round their shoulders and maybe yeah. lean forward, and you say this is because of the difference between the specifically skilled, trained body of the stunt worker, which will just incline them to to walk more like a gymnast or a, or a ballet dancer or, or something like that, whereas the actor might not. Yeah, I felt so bad that uh, you know it's it's so obvious to me. And I probably should have drawn lines through the photographs, but anyone who's watching this can see it right now because my shoulders are rounded and forward and my head is forward. Um, I am the, possibly one of the least flexible people, uh, at least in this time zone. And my, even though I know, all, I know how to study this stuff, I need to be working on my muscles here more. Whereas if we cut back to Paul, Paul has the most beautiful shoulders that are, I, I'm so, so, I felt guilty about this, but I always look at the way Paul stands because it's gorgeous. His shoulders are further back because of all of his training. Now, I don't know how much uh, flexibility work you, you do, but I know you're doing more than me and I can see that. <laughs> your, head, your head isn't as far back as a stunt person's head would be, but there's, you have a lot of strength in your muscles around your neck, 
that causes you to be, you know, up straighter and you certainly have better, a better stronger core than I do than me. So for this entire chat, I'm going to be like this. You see the shoulders roll forward. Just, well, I'm not doing it. The body just hangs that way. And you, without even noticing, have much better firmer posture with the head back further. And when you look at the pictures, when I discuss it in the lecture, I feel so guilty now. I should have drawn lines. But yeah, the stunt people, their head is always further back. And the actors have rolled shoulders. Even the strongest actors who uh, constantly talk about their workout routines, you see it because they work on bulking up, but they don't work on flexibility uh, because they really aren't being hit all the time. And if you are being hit all the time, if you're a martial artist or a stunt performer or a stunt performer who's a martial artist, you know that if you don't work on flexibility, you're going to get injured more often. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I mean, you make the point that you say, just just look at the way gymnasts walk. If you watch the Olympics, just look at the way the gymnasts walk and you can you can see that they, they, they're naturally, but it's a second nature. It's not a first nature. It's mm -hmm. they, they, they can't they can't not do it. I was thinking about, there's a book by, um, you know, Sanda L. Gilman, who, who wrote some really, he's written some really interesting books. He, he wrote a book called Stand Up Straight, which is all mm -hmm. about posture. Mm -hmm. And I read the book and it was fascinating the way that posture is being used as a kind of a disciplinary mechanism in, in so many realms for so long. But the one thing that he never mentions is that, yeah, all right, so military make you stand up straight and discipline to make you stand up straight. But to me, it feels like I, my body wants to stand up straight and it feels good. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, so, so maybe if you do more gymnastic work or more, I don't do much flexibility at the moment, but like my, if I hunch, my body goes, this is uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Sit up straight. So, yeah, up opposite. Straight. So if I hunch, I'm so comfortable. If I'm like, if my shoulders are rolled forward, so comfortable. If I try to stand up straight, Oh, so uncomfortable. And that's because of uh, strength training and flexibility. Okay. Yeah. And it is, you were saying first nature and it becomes first nature. That's the thing. It's not yeah. instinctive. It's because of the years of training. Not only are you told to stand a particular way, but the way that the muscles develop over time forces you into this posture and it forces you, it, it changes your comfort level with different uh, different postures, which is why I feel comfortable, you know, just falling on top of myself here. And you feel more comfortable when you're standing up straight. It's it, your body feels more at ease when you're standing up straight. Yeah, I, I think that's a lot of the pleasure of martial arts like Tai Chi, which really, yes. so I mean, I do, I do, I practice other things which involve like more punching and you, you hunch up a lot when it, you round your back. Uh -huh. and, and it's it's like I don't, it, the, your body doesn't want to do that it wants to be expansive and and, and tall like which tai chi is so relaxing in that that expand breath, kind of way breath work often um actually we're actually doing a lot of flexibility exercises when we, and strength training when we do breath work and people sometimes don't notice that as much but it it also helps you to to kind of create a it forces your body into a different posture. And the more often that you do it, the more likely you are to have that more upright posture. So even if you're not like doing yoga, which is also has tons of breath work associated with that, mm -hmm. um, any form of kind of breath work training over time is gonna change the posture of your body. Yeah, I like I like breath work. We've talked a little bit about this over email, haven't we? Uh, it's, I think since lockdown, since the first wave of the, of the pandemic, uh, everything in my life distilled down to what can I do that's really incredibly efficient and, and a nice nice breathing I found very pleasing and, and relaxing so I've done some of that who who um can I interrupt for just one yeah. second I just realized that many of the people watching this probably go to the martial arts studies conference and I just want to suggest them a bit of a bit of fun this is what I, I do so we're just talking about posture and I was talking about the difference between Paul and me obviously don't look at me at the conference but look at all of the practitioners we have there look at their muscle development uh, look at them and try and figure out which martial arts forms they practice even if you don't know because you can often tell based on muscle development if someone is in a, a more leg-based martial arts form you can tell by looking at their shoulders so often by looking at core and shoulders how much grappling work people are doing and that's that's really it's it's a little kind of it's a way of like spying on people and trying to figure out their preference in terms of martial arts yeah i mean you really see that with wrestlers and kind of really strong judo players like wow <laughs> they look like they look like fridges, they're like, yep. 
Yeah, yep, they're yes, they're so square. Mm -hmm. Their their thighs are just you can you can see it in the thighs. You can see it in the shoulders, and mm -hmm. the core is so straight. It's uh, it's a thing of beauty. Yeah. It's a square, yeah. big square thing of beauty. So you are. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this last time when you were on the podcast, but since then, definitely we have confirmed that you will be our keynote at the next martial arts studies conference in Switzerland in uh, end of June, start of July 21. Have you given any thought to what you might talk about? The theme is globalization and tradition. I mean, what have you got an uh -huh. idea yet? Uh, I do a little. I think that, um, so the martial arts studies conference is really one of my favorite, con I'm not just saying this, I adore this conference. Being asked to give a keynote is uh, in a way one of the biggest things that, it, it's one of the biggest things that could happen in my career. I'm so thrilled about this because I first felt at home when I went to this conference. And I think what I'm gonna address in relation to that is when we talk about stunt work, when we talk about fighting uh, and we think about how transnationally how stunt work traditions move, it allows us to combine the, the forces of everyone who's doing human, humanities work in martial arts studies, everyone who's doing social science, social science work in martial arts studies, and all of the work of practitioners. In fact, what it is, it's like combine, it's a giant workshop in which work across martial arts studies is all relevant to the study of fight work on film. We're not just talking about meaning, which is fabulous, which we should do. We're not just talking about um, particular communities that do uh, certain fight practices. And we're not just talking about the histories of those things and how they move from place to place. We're also getting to the specifics of performance like, uh, like practitioners do and how to move the body and how to talk about the movement of the body, which is so very difficult. Uh, so in doing all of those things and incorporating all of those things, we've really, we're harnessing all of the powers of martial arts studies. So I think I'm going to address the degree to which uh, discussing histories of transnational fight work in, uh, in film and TV allows us to really kind of come together as a martial arts studies community. And the ways in which each of us, even if we're working within the social sciences or within the humanities, or uh, if we're working as a practitioner, and it's not that these things can't be combined, that we can be doing separate parts of this kinds of research and it all connects. To some, to some larger uh, goal of making the labor visible and making shifts in martial arts tradition visible. Yeah, that's- I think that's, I'm gonna work on that. No, that's wonderful. I mean, the one thing that I've been increasingly persuaded by is this the, the connection, which I'm seeing from all angles now, um, people that I've talked to on this podcast and work that I've read about the intimate, almost like <sighs> constitutive place of, of, of dramatic representations and, and dramatic performances of, of, of physical skills. So, you know, at one point in your lecture, you talk about the, the birth of, not the birth, the development or the globalization of um, like wire work and how the first Superman film, the-, the, the um, 78. With, no, Stingy Reeves? No, um, what's his, what was Reeves, the actor? Reeves, yeah, Christopher Reeves from 1978. Christopher Reeves, that's the one. I always think Steve Reeves, he was a bodybuilder guy, wasn't he? Yeah. Christopher course. Reeves, and he, and, and, the, and the sheer effort that, that the, the producers and stunt people and, and, and technological people tried to, the, the, all the effort they put into trying to make the flying seem persuasive and plausible. And then the way that the, the Hong Kong film industry, they watched that really closely and went, how are they doing that? And then they, they did it better, like quickly they went, right, okay, we get this. And you say that is because an awful lot of the performers, their basic training was in uh, Peking opera or Cantonese opera. And that operatic tradition is already I mean, people have related that to the actual birth of actual Chinese martial arts, like they came out of the theatrical tradition. It's such an uh, interestingly entangled uh, a thing, isn't it? I mean, I think that looking at, some people might say that looking at film fight choreography and stunt work is somehow secondary to uh -huh. real martial arts. But uh -huh. I think there's a strong case for saying it is primary. Mm -hmm. It's it's the same it's the same history. It's a different branch to the same family tree. Um, when we look at how um, Peking opera, Cantonese opera, 
kind of fell out of favor with the public in Hong Kong, moving from the 70s into the 1980s because of the growth of television. People were watching more TV than going to performances. A lot of these people were out of work. You know, they, they weren't performing so much on the streets. And many of them sought work as stunt performers in uh, those films that were being pumped out by the Shaw brothers, uh, films that were being put out in a smaller su supply a little bit uh, later by Golden Harvest. And that kind of work, it changed the type of performance. Now, of course, this was happening earlier, and especially in the 1950s in Hong Kong, you have uh, a number of different martial arts schools that would actually participate in part of the funding for action films and would choreograph the films themselves. So when we look at the history of martial arts, it is in no way, no way separate from film performance. I do understand, um, and you hear this a lot from martial artists, that, okay, but you know, films, martial arts, they're not real. Yeah. And I think that's a really, um, that's a really understandable way to look at it because it's frustrating when you work on something your entire life and perfecting something and studying something. And then you see what looks like a kind of bastardization of it in front of you. But in fact, not only is it real and not only can we see the lineage and a variety of different lineages in, in performance, but you can actually, once you start to understand how things are shot and edited, you understand how hard these stunt performers and choreographers have to work in order to utilize their knowledge from martial arts and get something that actually looks dynamic on film. Because the reason why it's not real is once you start setting up the cameras and once you start protecting the actors, you can't really, when you have such short beat chains, you cannot really uh, articulate uh, martial arts form in the way that you can when you're in the, the uh, you know, a dojo or when you're practicing or when you're doing forms. Mm -hmm. So when we do see it and it's authentic, that's when we get excited, right? That's when the martial arts people get excited. They're like, I know that move or, oh, look at that. This is from my style. And that's when they really love a film. But really most of the films that you're going to watch, they're incorporating that unless all of the performers, all of the um, stunt people are gymnasts. And if they are, watch the gymnasts get excited about it. But you know, for the most part, martial arts is, is all, it's always there. And if you're looking at American cinema, the influence becomes a lot more heavy, heavy after 1999. Uh, if you're looking at TV shows after the mid 1990s, once the Kiwis started to do it in Hong Kong with, uh, started to do uh, Hong Kong style with Xena, uh, mm -hmm. just to go back to something you said earlier about wire work, like Superman, of course, which looks so rudimentary now, influenced Hong Kong. They just watched, watched Superman over and over and over again uh, to try and figure out how to do that without actually knowing. Same thing happened in New Zealand. They looked at Hong Kong action tapes and they sent them to the New Zealand choreographers of Xena, the stunt team, and they said, figure out how to do this. We wanna do this. So they just watched the tapes and they're like, okay, we have no tradition of this. How do we do this? So yeah. people were just working it out by themselves. So there are these, interlocking communities, this transnational flow of technique around the world. And some of it is because of direct content and some of it is because of just observation. So when we think about the history of martial arts and martial arts practice in relation to film, it's not as simple as saying, is, is that authentic? Is that not authentic? But to what extent are people actually learning um, from contact specific martial arts, um, martial arts techniques and incorporating them into film? And to what extent are people who are martial artists watching what other people are doing, watching film, and then trying to create an aesthetic out of that based on their, their own personal martial arts knowledge. So what we see on screen doesn't look like what we're doing when we're practicing ourselves, but it's every bit of it is part of martial arts history. Mm. But I, I think that another thing that you drew attention to in the lecture, in the third part in the the, the, the analysis section, 30 minutes of different analysis of different aspects of stunt work. You, you, we, you break down the scene in Ip Man 3 in the, in the elevator, the fight mm -hmm. scene. Um, and it really draws out. So you were focusing really on the length of the shots and the number of, of fight beats and so on. And, and, and the way in which it, and where there's real contact or, or stacking so that no one's actually getting hit. Um, and it really, made me think, especially now that we're talking about it again, it made me think of the way that there's a tradition in a, of Hong Kong films, which they're so, 
their lack of reality is the fact that they're so real. I mean, they're hyper real in Baudrillard sense. So because they're so like, the films are about style. So, you know, you've got it man in the elevator and you know, it's like, well, this is his environment. This is close <laughs> contact. This is Wing Chun. And yeah. the other guy, the first thing he does is try to do a head kick like yeah. in an elevator, right? Okay, who do we think is going to win? The Taekwondo guy or the, or the Wing Chun guy? And, um, and so there's so many beats, but like the, 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 the choreography in these films that, especially the, the, the cluster of films that celebrate Ip Man, they fetishize perf perfection in martial style, right? In the way that a Hollywood film might not be that bothered. They showcase the style like it's so you watch these films and you are actually watching Wing Chun choreography or you watch the raid you are actually watching um it's not Kali is it it's the it's the Indonesian one but you know um it'll come back to me in a minute it doesn't matter yes yeah, so Penchak Silat yeah so you're actually watching the showcasing of this of these styles and that's a big difference isn't it yeah it is but one thing that I need to point out there is these films that and I'm pretty sure anyone who watches uh, this podcast, you love those films. I'm pretty sure those people, at the, all of us tend to love these films. They're really, um, they're kind of stunning, shining examples. But when we look at Hong Kong cinema in general, though certainly more than Hollywood, and especially more than Hollywood prior to 1999, there's more of an emphasis on form. You'll find that there's you know, le much less of an emphasis on form and authenticity to form uh, in most Hong Kong films than in something like Ip Man, uh, or even if we're, you know, we're looking at Indonesian films, than in something like The Raid, same with uh, Filipino martial arts, same with uh, Japanese martial arts. There are certain films that stand out because of an attention to form. Mm -hmm. uh, and often those are the ones that are, uh, they're about specific historical figures that are connected to particular styles. Mm -hmm. Because if we look at, uh, uh, I hesitate to bring this up. I'm not going to discuss Bruce Lee in great detail. You are such an authority on Bruce Lee. But if we look at some of Bruce, Bruce Lee's stuff, um, you, you can see some of the technique, and his is, of course, mixed, but you can see some of the techniques that he's used before. But it's also really, it's, it's really short beat chains for, for the uh, Bruce Lee films. It's really supposed to be just dynamic in front of the camera, catch your attention, really smart and really um, poppy. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily pay attention to form in the way that his writing does, in the way that his speaking does, in the, in the way that any actual match that you see outside of uh, a film with Bruce Lee um, showcases uh, mm -hmm. his style and his beliefs uh, in his style. And the same thing with Chuck, with Chuck Norris in that fight scene between the two of them. You can physically see the difference, so many differences, the, the hair on the chest, but you can physically see the differences in their performance styles. But the emphasis on exact movements is it's it's not there in the way that it is in something like Ip Man. It's not there uh, like it is in the raid. It's not there like it is in even like Ung Bak, uh, where they're Ung Bak, and of course they're they were making up a lot of things for Ung Bak, but Ung Bak, you know, you can you can see the style there more than you can in a lot of Hong Kong films and a, a lot of now mainline Chinese films where they're they're using um, some martial arts techniques. But it's also really about editing and cinematography and making it look good for the camera. And even Jackie Chan says that all the time. He always he often says that you know this isn't like real martial arts, but of course it's based on real martial arts and it's based on the knowledge of martial artists. Uh, you combine that with styles of editing and cinematography. But to get to something that you said previously, yes, when we compare it to American style fights. Certainly all of them prior to 99, but even after 99, there's a tendency for shorter beat chains. There's a, t a less of an emphasis on style. And that's also because the global audience that is not us, that is not everyone who's watching this podcast and the American audience is really less invested in seeing something about a specific style and is less invested or less knowledgeable about the biographies of certain really well-known performers. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot to say about that. A lot to say about that. But um, I mean, I'm thinking about the the last point that you made about an audience being less invested in specific technical details. I always remember in in the second Karate Kid, you know, the the uh -huh. the one where he goes to Okinawa, and it's organized around like a technique that's embodied in the in the drum, the spinning. Yes, so yes, yes. You never actually see the technique. You never actually see it, and you just see. 
you see the effects radiated on people and someone that the opponent tries to punch him and he just kind of does something and you don't see what it is. And it's a film that's organized around a technique that is never made present. It's like it's it's like it doesn't matter to the audience. What matters is the love interest and the and the you know the fact that he's got a new girlfriend and all this sort of stuff. But Absolutely. for people like you and me, it's like, come on, show us the goddamn technique. <laughs> exactly. And we're the same people who are yelling at the screen when they remake the karate kid, still call it the karate kid, and it's not about karate. But the rest of the world isn't us, and they think we're we're loony for yeah. you know caring about these things. <laughs> <laughs> so did what did, did you watch the new did you watch Cobra Kai I mean did, did... I've been watching the first season of Cobra Kai I gotta t tell you something so while I was working on my book um which should be in press in like February or whatever but while I was working on it um my partner always like she's frustrated because we like I watch act we watch action scenes all the time she's even better at analyzing them than me but for a long time now I'd be like I can't watch anything new I can't I can't watch anything new because it's pleasurable but it's work yeah. and um so I I held off and we've been watching Cobra Kai now because you know I'm I'm away from the previous work that I was doing and uh, in the first season, like some of the first uh, bits of work that I've seen, like so far there have been low beat counts and I've not been that impressed with what I've seen, but that doesn't mean that, um, that I'm not gonna see more later on. I know a lot of the people I know are really excited about this show, but mm -hmm. the people I know that are excited about it, I, they're, they're not um, the martial artists that I know. So I'm, I'm not really sure how complex the, uh, the action design is for it yet. I need to really see the whole series. But one of the things that um, I'm working on this piece now on action television. Uh, one of the things that you really need to consider when looking at an action TV show as opposed to an action film is the degree to which the choreography, the action design, how things are shot, it, uh, it evolves over the course of a series because if you have a dedicated second unit for the series, then they're actually gonna have uh, more time to practice with each other. So when you're looking at something like a third season or a fourth season, you're gonna really, if, if they have, they still have, they're spending the same budget on action design, you're gonna see people do some really complex, intricate things in the, the latter seasons because you have the same stunt team that's been working together for years and they, you know, they're not going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. In fact, just uh, as a point on that, I, I spoke with uh, a stuntman who uh, works on Vikings, and he said that, you know, traditionally the Vikings, uh, they, they, they use this, this shield where they all come together as like one giant human shield, but they couldn't keep doing that episode after episode, even though it's historically accurate, because, you know, the, the design team, the stunt team is just like, Fundamentally, this is boring action. We have to evolve <laughs> to do other things. Yeah. No, it's but it's it's equally true in um, in in martial arts, like in sparring, in combat. It's like you want to expand yourself, don't you? Because you don't like you know you go training, and it's just about this this making natural of certain forms of movement and and, and reactions to things. Uh, but you you don't want to just keep doing that, even though it. Like, so when I was doing a screamer out and it was basic, like, okay, this is a challenge. Okay, what works? Simple, straight front kick to the shins. That's that's a good opener. But like, if this was a film, <laughs> you can't keep doing that. You yeah. have, everyone gets bored. Okay. So it's 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 almost like the, the choreographers and the action designers are responding to their preempting audience boredom. It's like, they might want to be authentic, but they, they're not allowed to be, even if, if it's a season that's going to run and run, they have to just keep innovating. Because it's their job. They're there every day, do, well, at least five days a week. In the 1970s, for something like Bionic Woman, six days a week. They're there all the time doing the stuff. They don't want to do the same thing over and over again. But at the same time, I do need to point out that the trained body does tend to do the same movements over and over again. So even if you know, we're watching performers and they're doing whatever kind of fight scene uh, the show or the film needs for that day. You can, you can see in those moments when they're not like executing something specific, the way that their body tends to stand, the stance that they use, that often comes out of whatever their longest running martial arts discipline is or whatever they've been focusing on more recently. They just kind of ease back 
into a stance. Mm -hmm. And it's at those moments. And usually those moments, you never, I've never heard a martial arts person go, yeah, that's our stance. You get excited about a hit or you get excited about um, some kind of maneuver, but you don't really get excited about, okay, this is a common stance that we all use that we're trained from the time that we're five or six years old to just stand like that. But that, those are the true telltale signs that, okay, this person's a martial artist and the entire structure of their training system is based on the way in which this has affected their body. Yeah, no, I guess I, you could, if you really knew the, the company that was involved in the choreography of a film, you could play spot the stunt worker because you go like, this one's jujitsu and this one's taekwondo and, and this one's a gymnast. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, you, so you might be able, see that bit there when, they, when the pause in between the beat? That's so and so because you can tell because it's that's kung fu or that short or something. Exactly. Yeah, I used to um, teach a guy tai chi and he was like fourth dan short and every time he was a little bit unclear about what the well even when he wasn't but but especially when he didn't know what the move was he would just default to some kind of cat stance or and I was like no it's not that it's it's mm -hmm. but he couldn't untrain it from himself it was yep. always going to be that was his primary habitus really I suppose. Yeah, so it's the moments in between the hits that we can really see people, the bodily disposition of martial arts performers or stunt performers who are martial arts performers, or even, you know, if they're gymnasts, it's the moments, it's the moments in between the hits, but quite frankly, for gymnasts, it's also the, the execution of particular flips and how they use their legs. Uh, but you, you can really see it even in the pauses. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if everyone finds that exciting uh, <laughs> because it's not as dynamic as, you know, seeing someone get kicked in the face with your style of kicking people in the face. But I love like looking and say, oh, you can see that that's Taekwondo right there. You can see like when I first looked at Zoe Bell in her moments where she caught where she's either posing for a camera, someone's going to take a picture of her or the moments before fights about to start on Xena, uh, especially in the latter seasons where she's the main double. You're like, OK, that's yeah. Taekwondo right there. She's yeah, just yeah. standing. See that. I used to uh, when I, a few I mean, I've been working on this stuff on and off for, for quite a long time and I used to be really, really obsessed with watching all the detail trying to absorb all the details of all the fight scenes and my wife would be going well what style is that now we well it's really interesting because it, it's and nowadays it's just often like well it's just some choreography it's just it's just the way they do fights now it's not it's not anything you know it's a bit of a mush it's not anything right it's 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 you know it's non-specific but if you look closely you can see you can see the training for some of it. And it does get really frustrating. I understand how it would be frustrating for a lot of martial artists. But if you can try and see it in terms of how complex is this beat chain and what kind of training would you need to execute it? Yeah. Um, so we can see style a lot less, especially in American films, but you can see the history of training and the degree of training mm -hmm. in how complex the beat chain is. Uh, not just, and you can have a long beat chain that's just like punch, punch, punch. You're not going to have that though, unless it's Sylvester Stallone, right? Um, but a really long beat chain between cuts where there are a lot of dynamic movements, even if they're not doing a specific martial arts form, this person had to train in a specific martial art form or dance in order to be able to quickly pick up a beat chain and do complex movement. Yeah. So dancers and martial artists, there you go. When you really look at fight sequences that have long beat chains, no matter what, uh, you were really, you're, you're looking at dancers and martial artists and you're looking at their training. Even if it's not, even if you can't see the style, you're, you're seeing the history of, of training. Yeah, and I guess that's why, I mean, I, I think we maybe talked about this last time. I, it's certainly one of my things I always go back to is the way that it's, it's actually really quite hard to, to, to show what's happening in, in grappling. So you, to make grappling authentic, they have to go for the big things, the rear naked choke, the arm mm -hmm. bars, the flying mm -hmm. guillotines and all these different sorts of things. They can't, they can't get at the, it's very difficult to, to show what it's like to be in a real tight grapple situation that's, it's just mm -hmm. inching and inching and inching yeah. rather than, so they tend to go for the close combat, with big, so big and small, but always, it's always hits, isn't it? It's rarely slow. It's, it's people flying over the shoulder, it's hits, it's, um, because otherwise, I mean, in the 80s tradition of how they would shoot action in the US, you know, you have a lot of those close-ups, close-ups on the neck and the, the arm over the neck. 
And that doesn't really address the way it affects the whole body, the amount of pressure on the whole body, the way in which the muscles are being used by both of the combatants. Mm -hmm. um, it's rare, but increasingly you are seeing more, uh, you are seeing more coverage of grappling. We may have discussed this the last time. I there's that Johnny, Johnny Yen, with, <laughs> but then there's that, um, I, I'm sorry if I discussed this last time too, but Banshee, like there's a lot of grappling on the TV show Banshee. And increasingly you're seeing them actually move out more so that you can see both bodies on the floor because for a long time you wouldn't do grappling stuff, not just because you know MMA culture hadn't quite uh, invaded uh, certain communities yet, including the stunt community, but also because people believe, well, you just can't shoot people on the floor. That's not exciting. Mm. Um, but things change because of uh, you know people who are trying new things and when uh, more people were doing jujitsu in the stunt communities in LA, which is increasingly happening, uh, you have people trying to figure out how can we shoot things from the floor. Uh, similar thing happened, this is a, co a complete aside, but a similar thing happened when they first tried to figure out how do we do these, these films about animals um, when the people had shot, you know, things like Lassie for so long, when they did Benji, like they're like, okay, we'll do it from the dog's POV. That sounds like nonsense, absolute nonsense. We'll put the camera close to the ground, absolute nonsense. And they, they were, they weren't professionals who were making Benji, but because they weren't, they tried something new. And now it doesn't look so odd to us when we have, you know, if you're watching an animal film and they shoot things from a lower height and from the animal's POV. Yeah. So it's just about experimentation. Sometimes it's about not knowing what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, so there's a couple of things that we need to talk about before before we go. Uh, one is, so tell us, when can we expect the book? I guess that's the, let's let's talk about the, the book first, and then we'll maybe go back to action films again. But when, when is the book? You're saying February, or are you saying? February should be released by Duke University Press. It's called Experts in Action, uh, Trans... Uh, transnational Hong Kong style uh, stunt work and performance, uh, and it's uh, it's you know it's on the title, but it's uh, it has a chapter on uh, Jackie Chan and the difference between his work in Hong Kong and Hollywood and the insurance restrictions on that. Uh, it has a chapter on Tony Jaa um, based on something I've published before on uh, the ways in which the Asian economic crisis uh, affected Thai production context and kind of changed what they were doing in Thailand, uh, has a bit of the history of Thai action in that one, uh, a bit on Xena and uh, stuntwoman Zoe Bell, and a final chapter on um, some research I did in the field in uh, New Zealand and in LA on the 8711 stunt team and on the team for Ash versus Evil Dead because I went on set and uh, got, I was um, working or watching alongside uh, Dana Grant, who's the stunt co-coordinator for the show, and Lily, Lucy Lawless, the stunt double. I interviewed both her and Lucy, and I watched them do stunts for Ash versus Evil Dead. So I talk about stunt teams in it as mm -hmm. well. But the entire book is basically about, um, to a certain extent, tracking the changes in uh, this kind of transnational flow of Hong Kong style in a host of different kinds of action performance. Excellent, excellent. And I guess uh, to kind of maybe end, maybe um, you talk a lot about stunt teams and they'll work in different national contexts and different um, different industries. Who, where would we see your your favorite stunt teams in action? I mean, you must have a favorite collection of stunt teams. I mean, where should we look for some maybe some recent or some classic films that you see the best your favorite action teams at work? So the difficulty is when we say classic, if you're looking in the American context, um, you, you really, you, you want to look at moments. So after 1973, um, you want to look at anything that was, and I'm not, not going to list films, but uh, stuff done by teams, but anything directed or sorry, choreographed by any of the Stunts Unlimited guys. And I'd like to say guys and gals, but no, they were just guys. So uh, Stunts Unlimited, anything directed, uh, choreographed by the United Stunt Women's Organization after like 73, association after 73. So like Jeannie Apper was on that, um, Mae Boss was on that. Uh, but you have th some really big guys with Stunts Unlimited. After 73, they start to do a lot of stuff with motocross work. Uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, driving and motorcycle uh, Choreographers and stunt women is Debbie Evans. You have to look at her work; it's amazing. 
Uh, the more recently, everybody knows about them if you're if you're watching Action Cinema. But, but 8711 out in LA does exceptional work. Uh, every member of that team is now kind of branching out and doing their own work for uh, for their own films and choreographing their own stuff. They were, you know, initially members working under uh, Chad Stahelski and David Leach, and now with Chad and David doing. Uh, act, directing for films. Some of the members who were just stuntmen or stunt women for those films are doing choreography in their own right. You have to watch, just look at 8711, anyone connected to them, look at their work. Uh, in terms of, in terms of Hong Kong, and you really are looking in the, in the early periods, you're trying to look for the work of particular Peking Opera Academies. So that becomes a little bit more difficult and more specific. Uh, and you can really just look to certain choreographers. I mean, we all know wh which choreographers we gravitate to in Hong Kong. And there it becomes, um, it's so much about school uh, and who's, who trained under whom, but people are kind of less aware of that. So you can look for individual choreographers like um, everyone looks to, uh, uh, well, I'll say it in English, but Yen Wu Ping. Everyone looks to the the uh, the Yen brothers, but there's an actual family tree of people who studied under their father, uh, who all use a kind of similar technique. Uh, let's see. In South Africa, piranha stunts, exceptional. Uh, some of the guys who are uh, running that, they were sailors, like they were competition sailors, and they have excellent rigging, which is why they were chosen, I think, for this pirate theme show uh, but they really tried new things because when you look at particular areas of of the world they don't have access necessarily to all of the equipment or to the long kind of stunt history in those locations so they're just really inventive so piranha in south africa and when we look to new zealand um I, I really think that what Dane and Dana Grant are doing is exceptional. They have their own stunt training school. The two of them uh, worked as doubles for the leads on Mad Max Fury Road. She was Char Charlize Theron's double and he was um, uh, Max who, who played Max. Um, Shoot, can't remember his name. Yeah. Uh, the, the one that didn't get along with Charlize Theron. He, he was his double. Uh, even their their like toddler does uh, stunts. Like their two three their two year old two and a half year old was doing stunts on Ash versus Evil Dead. So it's an entire stunting family. Love their work. Uh, Dane Grant is also known as one of the key inventors or uh, pioneers of parkour. Uh, so he does exceptional stuff. I'm going to shut up because I'm going to just keep talking about stunt people and stunt teams forever. But there are people all over the world. And like even, even last one, you're looking in Ireland, look at the Irish Stunt Guild. They're, they're training young, young performers. They're changing the kind of stunt work that's being done in Ireland. Looking in Northern Ireland, uh, the Devil's Horseman, right, who did all of the horse stunt works for, uh, horse stunt work for Game of Thrones. People, there's just amazing teams all over the place. Okay, so um, I think that you've you've probably sold uh, you sold this this topic to a lot of people. So if anyone wants access to your um, this the, this three part lecture that you've you recently composed and made, then they should contact you directly via your your uh, university email address, which is easy to find, and your book will be out. Uh, in say hopefully February maybe from Duke University Press. That'll be fabulous. Um, that'll be a, a kind of a happy new year. A happy Chinese new year, I guess as well. Absolutely. Ah. Just in time for Chinese new year. Exactly, wonderful. Okay, well, Lauren, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you again. So um, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you.